Hello everyone. Good evening to all those are in China. And according to your time zone, good afternoon and good morning. Can you hear me well? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, no, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, good evening to all those are in China and uh, good morning and good afternoon, according to your time zone. So we have some questions. Okay. No, okay. Just so do you have any question? Yeah, good afternoon, Murtala. Chongli, uh, what's your question? Sorry. <laughs> Do you have any questions? You just let me know. If you can turn on microphone at this time. Uh, just be careful when Professor Timo start class at that time, we need to actually mute ourselves. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, Chongli. Yeah, good evening, Niaz. Good evening from Hasib. Good evening, Hasib. Actually, good. Yeah, good. So it's like evening time in the most of the participants seems that near China, maybe from Pakistan or India, I think Bangladesh, Nepal, close here. Okay, any other question? Any question from your side or any suggestions we can discuss then we'll actually start the class after eight minutes left. Hello, Kishore. I actually found you very interested in the class. Have many yeah. questions from your side? Yes, yes. I am yes. actually attending the sessions and I like it. And me, me, I actually do a lot of proximal soil sensing. And okay. uh, yeah, so I, I, I was always interested in remote sensing as well because we have to combine both information. So uh, I do some work in that area. I, I actually did my uh, PhD from McGill University, uh, Canada. Okay, and, nice. Uh, uh, I'm from Canada itself, but I've been in India for a couple of years now, and I'm planning to go back uh, in a couple of months. So right now I'm attending your session from India. 
Yeah, okay, nice. That's great. So, did you learn well from the classes? And do you think that uh, is there anything that can be improved? Uh, no, it's actually good. Uh, I'm actually waiting for the PPTs, uh, you know, from uh, I, I only received this, uh, the first two PPTs. I've attended six, six classes and uh, I'm looking forward if there is actually some kind of, uh, you know, hands on course as well. So like okay. how to actually uh, really like do hands on using those images and uh, some software. Usually I, I use uh, GIS, QGIS and those, uh, those uh, kind of, you know, applications. And then I do some uh, programming in MATLAB and Python myself. Okay. So That's I, I, I only, I only know that. And I never did any work. Uh, I never did any work with, uh, with radar. I only did some work with uh, hyperspectral data. So I'm, I'm a kind of, you know, a soil spectroscopist. And uh, so this was something new for me. And uh, it's very interesting. You guys have actually, uh, you're doing a wonderful job in uh, organizing thank you. this session. Uh, yeah, thank I, you I like right two now. things, number one. I like two things. Number one, it starts at exactly the time and it, ex it ends at exactly the time. Means Professor uh, uh, Timo Balz starts exactly at sharp 7 p.m. and he ends it at exactly sharp 9 p.m. And that, that is actually really great. I mean, the, uh, like, you know, sticking to the time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for your praise. And also I get your comments and actually we have, we have plan actually to continue with the practical, maybe in summer, or I, I cannot say at this time when we will begin, but yes, we uh, have plan for practical and we will actually, uh, we have, uh, that's why I just made these groups as well. So we can inform you later about the new courses, like, and everything so we can share news and uh, other things that we actually want to more to get uh, to collaborate with each other to go for it so yeah that's thank you very much and uh, i will just give you a short introduction all of you and then uh, i will invite professor chimo to please to start the lecture so before that i just uh, will give you the introduction about our uh, company and uh, the aim of M of that, let me see why, okay. So actually the overview is uh, we, we, the Belt and Road International Geospatial Information Training Center is one that belongs to us. And that is actually supported by the, and uh, approved by China Association for Science and Technology. And uh, this center was jointly uh, applied for by Chajiang Association for Science and Technology and Association of Science and Technology Professionals, the Qing Special Geospatial Information Town, and managed by DG, uh, DQGST. So the aim of the BR, BTRTC is to provide the trainings and uh, pro provide trainings to the professionals and academics in geospatial information technology. And, and then if go for the internal, international cooperation in the field of uh, geospatial information uh, from different countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. And the next is to support the economic development of countries along uh, Belt and Road. And uh, also the last goal is the implementation of the UN uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and to make full use of geospatial information technology for that to fulfill the agenda. Um, we all we already have some uh, we started actually um, offline trainings as well uh, like this is one of the example in the south uh, south africa and also we have uh, same time we have two other courses uh, at the same time these are online courses uh, from professor wolfgang Gaines and professor uh, craig hancock so this uh, this is actually the this this was the just short, short introduction and if it if the time can then okay so we have two minutes two three minutes okay so i get actually very good comments and yeah slides slides will be provided to you soon yeah i and i i, I get many comments from that and uh, maybe i can also and also whatsapp group yeah i have actually sent email uh, email uh, today with the updated whatsapp group um, i i don't know if you did, Elena, you did not maybe able to receive the email or you didn't understand. Can quit to others, can enter. Yeah, I know. So I have sent email uh, and I will also actually share 
the share yes i will also share it today the uh, whatsapp group and also will send you the wechat group as well link of that so most probably you will get it even if you did not able to receive the email by that so any other problem or questions from your side let me check okay no yeah kishore you're welcome yeah it's really we, we are glad actually that the purpose of that uh, these training sessions are to let you help you to achieve your goals in terms of research or in the professional life so that, that's really good that you are actually it's helping it is really helping for you sure thank you for your comment so okay now we will start our class and i invite professor to please come and you can now begin your class All right, thanks, Tishan. Let me share the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. And Very clear. you can see the screen? Yeah, screen is also, we can see. Perfect. Okay, okay. great. All right, then let's start with today's class. Yeah, uh, just um right the slides uh i forgot today actually to prepare that sorry uh, i was thinking about it and i forgot to do it you're right we are a bit behind in providing you the slides um i try to put them together not by date but by topic but we finished the topic of uh, insa already so the slides for insa uh, you should get and today we will finish the topic of the insa so you should get those slides as well. We're gonna provide them soon, okay. Uh, there was, um, yeah, I forgot it, honestly, today, to send them to Zishan, okay, so he can provide them to you. Uh, but we will we will do that, certainly. Okay, so let me see for the questions that we didn't answer last time. Uh, let's go through them. So, is SAR image used to determine Foundation failure. Now, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by foundation failure, but I assume, okay, you mean uh, the building foundation and probably collapsing buildings. So, um, well, yes, the topic we are talking now on deformation monitoring, uh, I believe, can be used for that. However, uh, what we do is we measure motion we measure uh, deformation of buildings now to put a certain deformation that you may see in relation to a cause like foundation failure uh, but you need to know more about that right so by that i mean so if you have a foundation failure that can be seen by a deformation beforehand Okay, for example, the building starts to tilt in one direction. Uh, this can be seen, okay, All right? That can be seen beforehand. However, if uh, you will not see any deformation, uh, but the foundation is also weakening, right? Uh, may, you may be not see this. So only thing you see is if there is deformation, if there's motion, right? Um, I'm not a civil engineer. I assume if you see foundation failure, you're gonna have motion, you're gonna have tilting, right? So I would assume the answer is yes, okay? But again, not civil engineer. Okay, maybe there are foundation failures that do not express themselves as a motion beforehand. Okay, now application of SAR to earthquake. Mm, yeah, well, I showed you some. Okay. Now, first uh, is the differential inside the, the inside uh, where we can measure the, the motion, right, uh, by an earthquake or also seismic motions before an earthquake. Um, so this can help uh, the scientists, the geologists, uh, to better understand the motion that's actually 
better understand the causes, better understand the tectonic configurations right, that lead to that certain earthquake. So that's a, a certainly a widespread application of uh, SAR interferometry and uh, de insa especially uh, for earthquakes. And another one right, um, is well, post damage, post disaster uh, damage assessment, right? Uh, we uh, often then use SAR to assess damage to see the situation. Uh, on the ground to help uh, teams uh, to get there to analyze the infrastructure, like in that example. It's very, very, it's very, very important actually to analyze infrastructure. If you have a huge uh, disaster event, you need to send in lots of materials, lots of helpers, uh, heavy equipment, and so on. Uh, there's lots of logistics going on. And uh, if you have, a, like in the case of Ventron, if you have such a huge earthquake where also, you know, infrastructure gets damaged, you need to be aware of that. You need to plan that um, well. So there is huge demand for that uh, in that case. And there's SAR plays an especially important role, mainly because you can use it under all weather conditions and uh, disasters are often related also to bad weather conditions. So, um, Yes, also here uh, in that field, SAR can play a role. There is less of, a, currently there is still less of a, of a scientific uh, field, more practical one, right? In, in science, you would be more interested in automatically detect uh, damaged bridges, collapse bridges, damaged houses. There's also lots of research going on there. Uh, but until today, in, in practice, uh, it is mostly done by visual interpretation uh, from, from experts. Right. Um, anyway, also application. There are certainly several more applications uh, for that. Um, we have to think about it. Okay. Uh, but yes, there are several, several applications uh, for earthquake-related research. What is the best MATLAB tool for processing INSA data? I have no idea, honestly. I couldn't tell you, right? I'm not really aware of MATLAB tools um, besides commercial ones, right? Uh, that uh, use for processing INSA data. So I have to pass that one. All right, right. Um, there are the, um, also, but stamps, uh, which we, I will discuss maybe next time already or in two, after two times uh, of PS Insta 2, that's actually also is free and is running on, on MATLAB. And I will show you a list of, of some of the, especially the free tools, but also some of the commercial tools that are available. But in generally, I'm not really uh, familiar with MATLAB tools for processing Insta data. Okay, uh, we manage a railway line that passing sandy desert area, mountainous area, coastal area. What SAR can benefit as well. Now here in that course, we are mainly interested in uh, emotion, right? So we're interested in deformation. And uh, if you manage a railway line, you, may also be interested in deformation, especially if it is a high-speed railway line. High-speed railway lines are very sensitive for deformation. Um, and uh, they are also often monitored with the help of SAR interferometry uh, to see possible deformations along the line. Right? The goal is to identify areas which are interested. So in China, for example, there are uh, a large amount of high-speed railway lines. That are, I, I just read the number of how many kilometers. I forgot the number. Many, many kilometers, thousands of kilometers. <laughs> okay. And it is now impossible uh, to all monitor them by, by surveying teams. Okay. You can't really monitor that with traditional methods anymore. It's just too many 
kilometers to do that. So it is now quite common to use interferometry for that uh, to identify areas that are moving. And then after you identified areas, let's say areas of interest, area where you see there might be some motion in that area, uh, then the teams go there, okay? And measure them again uh, in situ uh, on the area. Um, so that is the, the common workflow. Uh, there are several reasons for that. A, not everybody is trusting that new technology, right? Um, some also some, you know, some often railway operators are in many countries uh, rather run by the government, run by the state or a state or an enterprise very close to the state. So they're typically rather conservative. I don't really want to rely and they shouldn't. Okay, it's about safety. They shouldn't really rely on all the new techniques that are coming up. Um, so, but now it's often that we use INSA to identify areas that are then measured. And another good reason is also a technical reason that maybe we have time to talk about more toward the end of the course. Um, but when we measure our points, right, we get our persistence scatterers. Now these persistence scatterers, and I will, let's say our measurement point, uh, is not always uh, on the railway itself. It might be close to the railway, but not really necessarily the track. So you may be measuring uh, a deformation next to the track, but not really the track, especially for high-speed railways. If you have high-speed railways, they are often on a very deep foundation. So it might be the area around the railway is actually moving, maybe subsiding, However, it may also be that you, the track itself is remains stable. So, uh, but these are a lots of technical details. It's very interesting to look at that what you're actually measuring, and I hope we have the time at the end to go a bit into some of these details. So, the deformation stability monitoring, uh, linear infrastructure stability monitoring, uh, would be what for me comes to mind, and what is uh, very widely used in many countries, uh, but also uh, in China, um, used generally for, for many of the high-speed railway to monitor many of the high-speed railways. Okay, how can I extract a CSV value of the interferogram pinches to be integrated with GNS values? Now, hmm, I'm not sure, <laughs> okay, what, uh, is the CSV value that you're looking at? Because uh, you know, uh, CSV to me means the comma separated value. So it is some kind of data format where you write out your values uh, separated by comma. Now, I wouldn't know what format you write it out and what are the values of interferogram finches you're looking at, right? Um, nevertheless, there are, if you look at interferogram, if you look at, um, well, let's say you look at motion here, okay? There are several things you need to consider. First, very important is uh, when we do interferometry, we are, looking at differences in motion. So we will not get uh, any kind of absolute motion value. Instead, we get uh, an information that uh, tells us this pixel is moving so many millimeters, right? Uh, in comparison to another pixel. So one pixel compared to another pixel, that's the information we get. We get a relative motion uh, out of interferometry. Uh, so from one pixel to another pixel. So if you want to compare that to any uh, absolute measurement values, you would need to first move towards absolute values, right? That you get uh, things that you actually can compare. Um, so that I think would be coming to mind uh, what you may need to do 
right here. You, what you're going to get from interferometry is relative motion or height from one pixel compared to another pixel, um, not an absolute value. Okay. How can we derive building roof forms using SAR data in case we would have a building footprint and SAR data? Well, I want us to, I wouldn't know, right? I would do that. Um, so, okay, let's say, let's say you would say, um, you want to use interferometry for that. Um, I want to get the height information. Now the, the main problem that you most probably is facing that you will get two less measurement points, uh, typically, on your building to really reconstruct the, the roof form. So if you want to do such roof forms, reconstructions from LIDAR data, um, you're gonna have many, many points on a, on a single roof. So you can actually then start to reconstruct that very well. Uh, for Saturday, you would have a limited number of measurements um, depending on the roof structure that you have, you may get even no measurement from the roof directly. Uh, so the signal may be reflected away. Um, you may, because you have a side looking system, you may just only see one side of the roof that would be rather common. If you would have a gable roof building, you probably just see one side of the roof. Uh, anyway, um, so that's gonna be difficult. Mm. Now, if you have high resolution data and only a single star image, you could try to analyze um, the layover, the shadow, the form um, of, of them to derive some information uh, of the building. You may be able and the optimal, and the good circumstances to reconstruct the roof from there even. Uh, if you have, I say, a limited set of, of roof forms that you're looking for. So if you only have, let's say, a flat roof and a gable roof, um, then you may uh, try to, you know, fit them. If you have only a limited set of models, you may try to find a fitting model. Uh, well, that would be possible, I assume, but certainly very, very difficult. And would certainly you would need, uh, in any case, a very high resolution data uh, to do that. Okay. How to know if there is uplift or subsidence in the INSA? That's a, a good question, right? So first of all, we would look at the, at the equation that we have. So um, in principle, from the measurement principle, uh, we are looking at the line of sight deformation, right? And the line of sight deformation uh, has, a, has a sign. It can, it's negative or positive. Uh, and typically uh, we define it as a positive being moving toward the sensor and negative moving away from the sensor. Uh, so if you only look at, if you only suggest it, it can only be subsidence or uplift, right? You would, you could uh, derive that from the, from the sign of your deformation. You're gonna estimate a deformation uh, either positive or negative one, right? So you would be able to get that. Now, again, when we look at that equation, that equation gives us um, the, the difference in the phase, right? But it is the equation itself would be the unwrapped phase, right? What we measure though, what we get from the sensor is not the unwrapped phase, but the wrapped phase information. Now, from the wrapped phase information, uh, 
to come to a, a measurement, we typically do uh, unwrap these phases. And uh, when we unwrap them, right, when we, oh, see, there's another slide. Okay. I think there's another question coming like that. Okay, when we unwrap them, I will then talk about it again when we unwrap them. Um, the, if it's going, you know, in which direction our unwrapping is going might be ambiguous uh, and we may end up with a wrong sign in our displacement, which could then be uh, at the end an unwrapping error. Right. Now, we, okay, so, where are we? Okay, now, if you are, if we extend your question into, you know, you really want the deformation um, and you want to be sure if it's subsidence or uplift or horizontal motion, right, because we only measure the line of sight deformation. So uh, we only measure in, in this direction here, right? So we can't really be sure if we are moving down or if we're moving um, to the east in that case, if we're moving horizontally. Um, to be really make sure out of that, you would need uh, two acquisitions on two different orbits, ideally ascending, descending, uh, and then if you have a line of sight direction from the other side, then you can solve that one and um, clearly identify if you have a, a, a subsidence and uplift or horizontal motion or what is very often the case, a mixture between both. Right. So, but uh, you're gonna need to make that for sure is to, to make sure about it is you're gonna have a, a ascending descending combination. Okay, that's the direction of azimuth changing ascending and descending. Well, that's certainly certainly the case. So uh, just to quickly go over that again. So when we have here ascending, our satellite moves in that direction, right? So our azimuth direction, our heading angle would be something like 350 degrees, right? Ascending, okay. And descending, we are going down. Our azimuth direction is something like 190 degrees typically. So yes, the azimuth direction is changing in ascending and descending. Um, yeah, okay. So I hope that's uh, clear enough. Okay, how to identify the look direction just looking into a star image. Now, I, I would suggest you not know, to do it, right? Because that means you don't have the metadata and then uh, you will not be able to do much with the star information. But in any way, if you want to do that, you best is to identify, for example, a building or another tall object where you can identify the layover direction, right? This would be layover or the shadow direction, right? This is shadow, okay? So, and then it's rather simple. The, the sorry, the, the layover, right? That building, so it's layover approximately in that direction. The layover goes toward the sensor or opposite of your looking direction. So if that's the layover direction, you're gonna look in this direction. And similarly, you can look at the shadow. Okay, this is the shadow, the shadow goes in this direction, right? So the shadow is in the direction of your, where you're looking. Okay, so if you can clearly identify a shadow uh, or layover, then you can identify the looking direction uh, of, your, of your sensor, okay? So you need to find some, building or something topography. This topography so that we can see layover and shadow. Foreshortening could also work, right? If you identify the direction of the foreshortening uh, and then you can derive the 
the looking direction. Okay. How to know the value of deformation is that manually by counting the fringe. Um, well, ideally no, right? Uh, oh, okay. I, I wanted to make another picture here. I was like that. Anyway, I know. So I showed you that by counting the fringe for you uh, in terms of a course, and you can do it manually, right? But otherwise, what we then do is uh, face and wrapping, right? The same that we use for DM generation, we also use for D in SAR. We can unwrap these faces with the face unwrapping process. Uh, and then we get to the unwrapped face, which we would then use to measure mm, the deformation, right? Uh, from the unwrapped face, uh, we can then, so I, I have to go back several slides. If we have the unwrapped, sorry, which one? Okay. Yeah, sorry, if you have the unwrapped face, right, after face unwrapping, if our face unwrapping is successful, right, and we get the unwrapped face here, okay, and then we can directly derive the deformation value here from the unwrapped face again. What you're gonna get is you, you're gonna look at the phase difference, right, between two points, okay, to derive the, like uh, actually the delta D, right, the deformation difference between these two points, because you're not gonna get an absolute value even after phase unwrapping, because you still don't have the total and absolute number of phase tracks that went through uh, but you have the difference uh, in that from from start from one starting point uh, in your image to the other pixels in the image. So you're still staying um, relative to each other. Okay, but after phase unwrapping, anyway, uh, you can get the phase the deformation difference between the pixels just from that equation. Right? So the answer again is no. To make it quick and short, ideally we are not manually counting them, we are putting it in the face and wrapper. Okay. And then um, look at the face values and transform them with that equation for deformation values or deformation differences. If we, for example, define one reference point in the image, let's say that point is zero deformation. Okay. And then the rest of the image is relative to that point. And then rather simply um, derive these values. Okay. Right. And uh, the reason why I maybe asked the question is because I went on and on through the course by manually counting that, uh, but more just to, you know, to demonstrate how that would be done or how the face and wrapper, you know, what you got to get at the end. Um, but in practice, we're not very seldomly doing it manually by just counting the fringes. And if you just want to have a rough estimation, it might be faster. Anyway, okay. How to clarify if it's an error or lens like motion? Well, that's good. No, good question, right? There's not a good answer for that. Um, so typically, we're gonna have to see that we get a, a, a clear enough signal so that we can say, well, that is not, you know, noise. So you have to separate it from noise. There is, um, well, <clears throat> what kind of error you're gonna have? You have typically, uh, there might be atmospheric error, okay or DM error. There would be the two errors that uh, play a role here because just uh, noise, you're gonna separate noise from your clear signal. So let's assume you have a signal, right? Um, now atmosphere, the atmospheric noise, the atmospheric signal is rather 
it's rather long, okay? So you're gonna have slow changes over the image. Uh, while a landslide is typically a rather small area. So it's typically, we are not confusing uh, the landslide. If we only look at the fringes, at this moment, I assume you only look at fringes, okay? So typically we are not really assuming uh, the atmosphere, not really confusing the atmosphere of this landslide. Uh, so the aerosols were probably most dangerous in that regard would be the DM error. And that <clears throat> that's there because if you have a landslide, you typically have a relatively steep mountainside. Uh, that also means typically your DM is often not fitting as well as it should. Uh, so on that side, you may end up with uh, DM errors, and now you need to, to, to separate them. Uh, that can be challenging, right? That can also be, you know, at the end, by only looking at the fringes, which sometimes they do in that case, um, you come to the you come to the realm of human judgment, right? You're gonna to have to judge that. So experience plays a role then. Um, and sometimes also like previous knowledge by knowing why there is a landslide there. Uh, what's a bit an advantage is uh, typically, not always, but typically the DM errors are mostly more related to the top of the mountain range, you know, and the valley, so the, the misfit is mostly there and not so much on the mountainside itself. So that can help you to separate them. Right. Uh, but at the end, it's a case by case uh, situation. If you have a very good signal, means if you get very coherent uh, signal, um, you're gonna see the landslide very, very clear. So the most problem is if you have a rather noisy, incoherent signal to begin this, uh, you may end up a bit in trouble. Anyway, interpreting these fringes for many reasons, not really what we want, okay? As you come to the human judgment and we do not like that, okay? Because it's full of errors, <laughs> okay? So, um, we we'll come and talk today about more methods where we get to numerical values at the end. Okay. All right. If we monitor the, the movement from glaciers, we're going to have a time series, so we're going to have many images. Um, I make, for example, the INSA about that. Um, so now the question is. Because we're using the same DEM, right? Can we say that the DEM errors will be eliminated because we are uh, looking at the same scenes um, with, at the end, the same DEM error, right? Mm, but it's not so easy. So if you're looking at the equation here, which gives us here uh, the, re the relation between the difference in height between two pixels and the difference in the topographic phase between two pixels, right? That's the equation you would need to solve. But the issue is, um, although your DM stays the same, uh, your baseline does not, right? Between each image, the baseline is different. So um, if, we, if we solve toward the phase, if you solve to work here, Delta, couple, uh, you will see that that even if Delta height is the same, so the height L is the same, the perpendicular baseline is not. So the phase that derived from that height error will be different each time because it's each time a different baseline. Um, so you will not be able to just do it like that. However, the baseline is also a known value. And uh, so you can go in there, you can go uh, looking at the difference in baseline, 
uh, and estimating actually the height error, if you have many examples, uh, you can then estimate the height error using that information. If you know the height error, right, if you identify the height error, you can then, because you know the baseline, you can then calculate the topographic phase error and remove it. And so that's possible. And that's what we are going to do in, in PS INSA. It's one part of PS INSA in it. Uh, but it's not as easy without, correct, okay, without correcting it. Uh, it will not work because each time you get a different phase. So it's not as easy if you say, well, uh, the topographic phase will always be the same. It isn't because the baseline. Uh, so, okay. So in coherence, we have a, a value that we interpret. In interferogram, we have to see directly the image for interpretation. We will not get values. Well, you get values. Okay, you can ideally, uh, for example, unwrap them and then uh, get phase differences between two pixels. You can then uh, calculate the formation difference between these two pixels and so on. So that is all true. We were looking at interferograms and interpreting them so far uh, because that's rather common in, in, in the INSA. But we are moving away from that now today when we're moving toward PS INSA. Uh, and other multi-baseline methods. So that means methods where we use multiple images to analyze that. And then we move toward getting values, okay, away from interpretation. We do not want that, okay? We do not want really to interpret these images. Um, we want to have measurement values, right? And we're gonna get them, we're moving there now. Okay. Okay, how to convert the line of sight deformation into actual deformation or 3D deformation? You see, that was the question. Actually, I should have put these two questions together. All right. So I already answered that a bit. Uh, what we're going to have is we have to do that. We need two measurement values, so two stacks, two images from uh, ascending, descending, ideally. Uh, then we can here uh, form a 3D vector of these two measurements and derive the, the, the motion uh, in vertical and horizontal direction. Where we can actually then also derive a 3D, a 3D deformation vector. And so if we have two measurements, what we need to identify identical points. That's uh, basically a challenging value because you're looking from two different directions. What we typically do is we um, average over a similar area. So we say, okay, from we take the, the measurements in the in a certain pixel from the ascending and the measurements in a certain pixel from the descending, and then uh, derive the the vector for the values in that in that pixel area, uh, and then this is a, it's a rather simple equation. I'm just thinking. I think I don't have the equation on the slide. I think I can put it on some slide. On it's rather simple, uh, and you can look it up uh, to come there to then um, horizontal and up and down measurements. But what you need is two measurement vectors. Right? Purely theoretically spoken, you could also start to separate uh, if you have like a, a different orbit direction, but generally from the same direction, right? So two ascending orbits, but a different looking angle. You could also start to derive a uh, certain I don't really want to say 3D, it's more like a better than 2D, you know, uh, um, vector because you don't have a really good angle to do that, right? But 
best is ascending, descending, but the Q minimum is that you need two uh, measurement values. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you cannot go from a 1D to a two dimensional, even three dimensional measurement. Okay. Aside from SRTM, are there any other high data that can be used for hydrological analysis? Um, now the data is a bit outdated. Um, does this have negative impacts on the analysis? Well, A, I guess if it has a negative impact, that very much depends on your test area, right? Is there have been there huge changes or not uh, from the time being? Um, but there are other data available. Um, so, but I can't comment on their, on their quality or on their suitability for hydrological analysis. Uh, but you may look at the, where we have the Aster DM, that's some optical data from the Aster satellite. There is the ALOS DM that's derived from the Japanese radar system, the ALOS system. You can uh, look at the at the tandem X uh, DM, the 90 meter DM would be freely available. And the higher resolution data uh, is available for scientific use if you uh, let's do write a proposal on that. And uh, now recently, I guess the, the idea would be to look at the so it's a Copernicus DEM. I think that's also available now or soon. That's from ESA. You, you may try to find that Copernicus DEM, uh, which is also partly based on tandem and then added this additional data. Um, yeah, that, that would come into mind. There are probably more. Uh, you can search that, but on their Suitability for hydrological analysis, I can't comment on that because this I, I really do not know. Um, but you might look at them. I think the Copernicus DM is probably the, the newest one. Um, so try to find that one. Okay. Right. So that has been the questions from last time. Okay, so let's take a look at I go back a little bit on what we talked last time, just to move into our, our new topic, okay? So we were looking at differential interferometry and uh, differential interferometry we do in the repeat track mode. So that means the, our satellite is taking an image, right? And when it's coming back, at the same orbit, taking a second image. Uh, so that we have, right, for measuring motion, we need a certain time difference, right? A difference in time. Um, be it satellite or be it airborne, you fly and you come back at a similar position, which by the way is much more difficult to do with an airplane than this with a satellite. Uh, but yeah, then you can do uh, the interferometry, which is looking at phase differences anyway, right? But if there's a time difference, uh, we have atmospheric differences, right? So the atmosphere is different. We have a, a pass delay difference uh, through humidity, water, vapor content, air pressure, and so on. Uh, we have, we see differences in the vegetation, which can lead them to temporal decorrelation because now we're looking at very different things. Okay, our signal, you see, if you look at this extreme example, okay, our signal gets now reflected somewhere. There's no leaves, so it gets reflected somewhere here, right? And here it gets reflected somewhere more on top. It's a huge difference on, on the face center, right? Uh, so you're measuring we're very different points even. You're not measuring the same thing anymore. Uh, so your signal is not coherent. Uh, and that's part 
this one of the temporal decorrelation. But what we're interested in, in differential interferometry is actually this difference uh, in the position, this motion, this deformation. Uh, that's uh, for differential INSA what we are looking at. Now, oops, uh, the temporal decorrelation is the main problem that we are facing here. We see after one day. Uh, we still have lots of good information from the interferogram, not so much uh, the correlation beside the water area. Okay. Uh, but after 50 months, we have most of the area is completely decorrelated. So that means you would not get any useful information anymore. We're just now in the noise. Uh, so that is the huge problem if you want to measure motion, the temporal decorrelation. Now, when we are measuring a DEM, we can, uh, we can fix that. We can fix that by taking measurements at the same time, like in the SRTM, for example, we have the transmitting antenna in the shuttle and the receiving antenna in the shuttle and another receiving antenna outside of the shuttle. Uh, so if we're taking the measurements at the same time, we do not have temporal decorrelation. We have a very, very little temporal decorrelation. I have to say that because actually even for SRTM, the time difference between these two images is not exactly zero. There is a small time difference between them. Uh, but anyway, very close to zero. And we have uh, basically no atmospheric differences between these two images. Again, there's small, small atmospheric difference because their path is not exactly the same. But again, very, very small differences. So we don't really have temporal decoration problem. And atmospheric problems in that configuration. However, if you're taking the images at the same time, you can't really measure motion. You can measure motion in the time difference. Otherwise, you can't measure it. So it's not going to work like that for if you're interested in motion. So the problems of atmosphere and temporal decorrelation that just come back to us again. Right, and then I already showed you the slide, the surface motion contribution right, uh, is can be calculated the phase of that so pi divided by the wavelengths times the motion. Um, and that again, that it would be the, sorry. Yep, yep. Again, that would be here, the unwrapped phase, uh, but we actually, what we actually get, ugh, I'm writing so ugly, okay. <laughs> what we get is the wrapped phase, right? It's not so easy to paint this mouse, it's the mouse, <laughs> okay. Right, it's the red phase, that's what we measure. So from minus pi to pi, uh, the red signal, which is not the same, right, it's not the same like this one. This one would be the unwrapped one, but we actually measure the red one. So we need to unwrap that um, to, to get there. Uh, we need the unwrapped measurement to get to the deformation. So. Again, the wrapping of the phases needs to be solved uh, also here. Right. Um, if, right, if D or better, right, we're actually looking at delta D, right? Actually, we're looking at phase difference between two points, uh, deformation difference between two points. If delta D is very small, right? If it's smaller than the two pi, right? Uh, uh, then we do not need to unwrap, right? Because then our measurement, the wrap measurement would be the same as the unwrap measurement, right? Because it is smaller than two pi. In that case, right, for very small motions, uh, we do not need to unwrap and can directly get to the measurement. The problem is, well, we don't really know that, right? because we only have the web measurement. If we just assume they are always small, we are probably underestimating every motion, okay? Because they might be wrapped. 
we're coming back to that uh, over time and quite a lot, but yeah. Right, this, uh, the backgrounds here. Okay, now our INSA, it contains the topography, right? The motion, the atmospheric delay and noise. It's all together, right? If you want mixed together in the phase that you get and plus, right? Uh, what would need to say, the topography, we have the topography phase that would be like an unwrapped phase, the motion phase would be an unwrapped phase, the atmospheric delay would be an unwrapped phase. The noise, not really, it doesn't matter. Um, and all of them together gives you the unwrapped phase, but what you measure would be the wrapped part of that. So, again, not so easy to get them from there to the original values. Nevertheless, okay. So if we are interested in motion, then we want to remove the topography, right? And the, the atmosphere, right? Or like here we can ignore, we can try to ignore the atmosphere and the noise. Um, so we can get to the, the, the motion, right? So goal is in that case here to, to remove the components, uh, to estimate the, the components and then remove the, the components that we're not interested in. And not to forget the motion that we measure uh, is always in the line of sight direction of the sensor, right? And then typically the DINSA results, they look uh, something like that. So you have uh, here these pictures that we then try to interpret. Uh, we can also measure, like we could, right, in that picture, because you get questions like that. So you could measure the face value here, right? A uh, face value here. Yeah. No, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So another face value here. Okay. And uh, you know, take the difference between these two face values. Uh, let's say if you assume that would be the stable point, and uh, you can measure what's the difference in motion from here. To here, okay, you see from there to there, there is, uh, that's not, that's less than a phase cycle, so you wouldn't even need to unwrap it, okay. If you, if your reference point is somewhere, you know, here to measure to here, well, you're gonna need to unwrap from here to here because it's more than a phase cycle, okay. Uh, but certainly we are not only, even in the inside, we are not, only looking at the beautiful picture and trying to interpret them. And we can also measure in them, uh, especially in unwrapped examples, um, and then go there and, and get measurement results also from here, okay? Point is we are often trying to interpret to see is that now real deformation is atmosphere, so that's more of an interpretation question so that we can, let's say, judge the measurement values that we get, that we can estimate uh, their validity or their meaning, right? And, but unfortunately, again, in the INSA, we are often in this interpretation phase. Uh, we are working with interpreting images, which is not really what we want, which I also can see from lots of your questions that you don't really want that. All right, now, again, we have these inside phase contributions, right? They are important. So let me go the flat interferometric phase. That's that one. Uh, we can remove that just by the so-called flattening process. I, I showed you that token inside. That's relatively easy to do, and, and typically uh, we can do that easily. Okay. Uh, then we have contribution from elevation, displacement, atmosphere, and noise. Well, noise is hopefully small because here we talk mostly on terminal noise. So the three main components that we have are the elevation, displacement, and the atmosphere. And you see uh, the, right, if you want to have the, the phase information, the phase with respect to a given with respect to a given high difference 
uh, can be calculated like this. This is the equation. Right? All the other values are known. We know the incidence angle for each point. We know the range to each pixel. And we know the, uh, the baseline uh, for each interferogram. Right? Then similar here, we, we can calculate the phase uh, based on the deformation. We know the wavelengths. Uh, so we can get to these values. Okay. So this, um, right, let me mark, two, sorry, these two equations here, the equation on, of the relation between the difference in height uh, and the, the uh, elevation phase, right, and here the, this equation is the difference in deformation and uh, displacement phase. These are two important uh, equations, right? That we're going to need uh, later on for PSE size question. Now, in terms of the atmosphere, we do not have an equation to calculate that. I showed you one, right? When we talked to in INSA. Uh, we talk about INSA or also such here, the C. Uh, there is, you can calculate that delay uh, that is based on weather information like water vapor content, air pressure, temperature, uh, electron content in the ionosphere. Um, so if we would know all these values, we can calculate them. The main problem is we do not know them in the resolution that we would need them. Okay, so we, we can get these values um, globally. You can download them. There are different models available, uh, also globally, and then you can download them. But the resolution is typically very bad. In it's not that bad actually <laughs> for a global model, but much worse than what we would want. With respect to the you know the resolution we have in our sound systems, uh, so we're not really getting there. Okay, uh, that's uh, the main issue, right? There are you can calculate that, but we're gonna fix, we're gonna solve that, and we're gonna estimate the atmosphere from the sound data itself. Uh, that's the way that we fix that. Okay, so these are the important phase contributions, um, especially elevation, displacement, and atmosphere. These are the three main components that we're looking at. All right, that was it. That's where I stopped last time, basically, but um, there are two, three more slides in terms of the INSA that uh, I wanted to show you. Uh, so, um, what we discussed until now, right, is the function that we call the across track INSA. Now, but we can also do a long track INSA that makes a cross track is, right, uh, but in the looking direction of the sensor, right, transmits uh, E annotate here. So this is the direction we are looking at. Okay, let's see a cross track direction. And the along track direction is the satellite, is the direction our satellite is flying toward. We can also do interferometry in this direction, right? So what we are measuring are these phase differences, right? So um, when we let's say we have here like an expand system, okay, so our phase. Wavelength is 3.1 centimeter. In the INSA, we measure a full phase cycle, phase cycle is half the wavelength, so something like 1.5 centimeter. So in our delta t, in our time difference between our two acquisitions, right, we measure things that are ideally below one movements that are ideally below 1.5 centimeter so that we 
right, can get them without unwrapping, right? So we are measuring very slow motion, right? And if you think about, we have our, our satellite, okay, Terrasa X is going around, comes back to the same place in the same orbit after 11 days. So the speed of things that we measure would be something that measures about a centimeter in 11 days, okay? So very slow motion, all right? So you know, something that moves in the, in the area of a centimeter or less than a centimeter in these 11 days. So you can estimate what kind of things you can measure. However, if we, if we have a much shorter delta t, if we have a different delta t, um, then we can measure faster motion. So let's say we have a satellite constellation, right? We have satellite coming back. We have multiple satellites. Let's say we can make an interferogram after one day. So now you can measure something that moves about a centimeter a day. We come back after four hours. You would be able to measure something that moves a centimeter in four hours. You see, then we would move more towards something like uh, we, we talked about, uh, we had a question about the glacier and the ice, right? If we have such a short revisit time, we could do that better, right? Um, so, what we can measure, right, is a, is a relation between our time difference and the wavelengths. Now, if we reduce that time difference even more and make it very short, and we can measure even very fast moving objects. So, you see, uh, we can actually separate these experiments done in the SRTM, in the X band SRTM, right? If we separate that antenna from that antenna and take the time difference between them, which is very short, right? But there is a time difference. And then we can look at what is moving centimeter, some millimeter during that short time, okay? Or the other one is here Terras X by separating the antenna so you, if you separate uh, what the whole antenna is transmitting, uh, but you separate the reception from the first half of the antenna and the second half of the antenna, right? Uh, so there's a short time difference between the front and the back of the antenna. You can imagine it's a very short time difference. But if you have something that in that short time difference is moving a millimeter, right? Then you would have a phase difference and you could measure that. And that's for example, fast moving cars. Okay? Fast moving cars, uh, you know, going around on the street, they're moving. And if you, uh, even that's in that short time difference, they are, you know, depending on their speed, but they're moving up, you know, probably a millimeter. That would cause then a phase, difference uh, that we can measure in that along track in South. And so by using antennas uh, that are separated along the track, along motion, uh, we can measure motion differences, phase differences uh, caused by, it was in a very short time. So very fast moving objects and we have some examples on that. Uh, for example, a tidal current, uh, I can measure here the, uh, it's very interesting part in the motion of the, of the sea, right? Uh, the tidal currents here in that area. It's very interesting because uh, it shows you that for, uh, that is water. So we have some coherence for this very short time on water and we can measure here uh, also the motion on water under these very short 
um, time difference so that the water stays cooling and we use it. Also, we have the phase difference because this is rather fast moving. That's a very, uh, very interesting example of, of, you know, how far we can go with um, SA and INSA measurements here. Uh, or another example is then on the cars on the motion uh, with a long track interferometry on estimating here the motion of cars. Um, so you can see, and I showed you that before on, on this example on bridges over water, right? So to the example of this uh, cars going over bridge over water, we find the cars in the water. Uh, and, and it's similar here. So this is this would be the car uh, that we measure. Well, this you see this red ones. They are displaced. They are put away from the displaced away from the road, right? And uh, normally we couldn't find them because they're somewhere mixed. Uh, what we can do then by looking with a long track interferometry, we're looking now at pixels that have a phase difference between them in this in this very short time. Right. And these are then fast moving objects. And now we can identify these fast moving objects, even if they are not on the road, we can identify them by having a phase difference uh, between them. Uh, and so uh, in that way, we can here identify all cars uh, moving along the street, uh, which in the other example, we just could identify them when they are on water, because then we have them on these we can separate them from the dark background, right? And in this case, we do not need that because we're looking at phase differences. But what we need to do that is we need to have the antenna configured in this along track interferometry mode, which is typically not the case, right? Uh, so this data is here uh, available as experimental data, as scientific data uh, from the DLR. Um, but it's not like mm, generally available for all areas. Okay. Nevertheless, if you would want to, you could always construct a satellite that's doing that as a standard mode. And there are lots of airborne SAR system that are doing a long track interferometry and the speed and car measurements uh, as their standard mode, mostly for yeah, for military interest because we can detect on moving objects or moving cars and well, non-cars uh, over a large area. Uh, so that is of, of high interest for security and military applications, right? Um, and that's how it's done basically by having the antenna in a long track configured a long track so you can measure them fast motion instead of very slow motions. Okay. So to have a short summary on DISA here. So when we are, we are, we are combining, we're different, making the difference of two complex phase. So I mentioned the difference in the phase, right? Um, and we are looking at the phase differences and we, we have different things that we do with that. Okay, so this is separated by the baseline types. Uh, so let's take a look. So um, if we have a difference in the angle, angular difference with a cross track, that's inside. We're looking then at topography making DEMs, okay? So we're interested in differences in the angle. These differences in the angle for different topography will lead to phase differences. Uh, based on the topography, and then we can use this to, do, to get DMs, okay? And the other ones, you see the other ones are delta T. We're looking at uh, time differences. Now, if you have a very short time difference, some milliseconds to seconds, that's what we call them a long track interferometry. And what we do is ocean currents or moving object detection, fast moving object detection, that's right. If we have a, a time difference from days or hours, it's then called differential interferometry. That would be uh, glacier ice fields, lava flows, um, hydrology, 
Um, there you would, most of them you would rather like hours than days because they are moving relatively fast. Right? So um, that's why we separate them from uh, delta t from days to years, which is still differential, but uh, then we're talking about very slow moving things, so subsidence, seismic events, crustal displacement, volcanoes, these things, they're very slow moving. Uh, where we have then millimeter, centimeter per year. Um, that's what we then also measure. That's what we typically measure with the, let's say, the standard differential in these are applications. And then last but not least, by looking at the coherence, right? Uh, and uh, at different time delta time, right? Uh, we can see how long does it take for sea surface to decorrelate and also land cover classification. So we could separate if we have a wide range of time differences, even including different milliseconds, seconds, days, hours, right? We could difference different water decorrelation types, but uh, land cover classification, you know, uh, water decorrelates very fast. Right, uh, but we can say well different lower vegetation uh, they correlate slowly. High vegetation forests they correlate fast. Urban areas do not decorate or extremely slowly. So if you have many images with different delta t's with different temporal baselines, we can then look at how fast does a pixel decorrelate over time quite interesting uh, for land cover classification, especially if you think it also seasonally. So if you have really many images going over seasons, uh, you have a, a winter, summer season, or rainy, non-rainy season, and then you will get, um, well, how fast does it decorrelate in winter? How fast does it fix it decorrelate in the vegetation season? When does the vegetation, you know, season begin? When does this crop, begin to grow faster. Uh, you could really look a lot there this years in terms of land cover classification. Um, and I point you to that because I also think that is still a rather under-researched uh, area because I believe now with Sentinel where we really have that data where you can go, you know, uh, we have now years of data available every 12 days, so you would have seasonal information. Um, some areas every six days, uh, so you I think quite bad. Establish some kind of, of land cover classification over time, which again, I think is um, under research. There could still be more research done in that field. Okay, now that was it from differential interferometry. So we are coming to the next uh, big topic on the permanent scatterer interferometry, which is the extension uh, of the differential scatterer interferometry, differential interferometry, sorry. Uh, and we are looking here again at motion, slow moving objects like subsidence, uh, volcanic activities, uh, seismology, something like that. Um, so, uh, but over like over longer periods, and the goal of permanent scattered deformity is to overcome the problems that we have with the inside. I don't show that slide again. It's boring. We just saw it. Okay. So, what are the problems of? The dinosaur, well, that's obviously a typo. That's obviously autocorrected. And I did not see it. It should, it should mean D insa, okay? Right, so I have to change that before I send you out the slides. Um, but yeah, all right, D insa, it should mean D insa, okay? Okay, so what we have as main problem is the temporal decorrelation, okay? Uh, so as soon as we go over a couple of days or months, 
we lose all correlation over the image. This is a huge problem. So we can't really use the INSA to monitor over a very long time. We want to monitor over a very long time because these elements like subsidence, um, tectonic motion, we want to monitor them. You know, these are slow objects. We want to monitor them over long periods of time. Um, so that is very important. Temporal decorrelation is really by taking away the, the applicability of, of the inside here. Then we have atmospheric effects, right? We do not acquire the images at the same time. We can't because we want to have a difference in time, right? So we have atmospheric effects on it, which makes then the measurements and also the interpretation sometimes quite difficult. So what we do with permanent scatter is we're looking at many images. So um, not only two or three images, but we're looking at a rather large number of images what we can call a stack of images. And then we're looking at single targets. So we're looking at single coherent targets that are not affected by temporal and geometric decorrelation. And we call them permanent scatterers. And we use them then to estimate the atmosphere, right? And remove that. And then we can come to the phase contribution uh, in good accuracy. So what we are doing is, right, in terms of temporal decorrelation, we are not really, we are not really fixing temporal decorrelation. Okay, we are avoiding that. So you see, we are looking only at points, all right, that are that are slightly affected by temporal decorrelation. Okay, so we're looking only at a subset of points. We're looking only at those points that do not suffer from temporal decorrelation. So we're not really fixing temporal decorrelation. We are avoiding it by concentrating on other points. Now in terms of atmosphere, we are then actually, we are, here you see, we are removing the atmospheric phase. So we're estimating the atmospheric phase and removing it. So this, if you want this problem, we are actually solving. While the problem of temporal decorrelation, we are not really solving, we are avoiding. Okay, so uh, let's take a look on, on how we do that. All right, I just showed you that phase, that slide again. So like, this is better, okay. So when we're looking here, right, at this image here, so you see there's a lot of, of, of noise on the left side. It's a very noisy image, right? And in the middle, we are only looking at a few points. So these are the yes, stable points, the so-called PS, the permanent scatterers, okay? So these are the points that are not affected by temporal decorrelation. And if you're only looking at them, now we see a structure, right? Well, on the left side, it's only noise. Uh, if you're only looking at the stable points, we see a structure we can interpolate between these points uh, to get uh, to, a, to a deformation signal or to, a, to fringes, right, if you want. Uh, so in the, on the very left side, because of the noise, the information is there, you know, it's the same points, they, these PS points, they're in that noise, you just can't see it, right? Because uh, there are so many non-stable points around it. But if you are finding the stable points, if you're able to do that, and then only looking at them, then we come uh, to, to extract useful information out of the noise, right? Which you will not be able Mm, if you cannot separate them, right? if you don't know which point is stable and which one is not. Okay, so we're looking at those PS points, uh, points that we can observe 
over long periods of time that stay coherent, right? Uh, and we are only looking at the basis for these points. And then we can uh, like, um, interpolate these faces and unwrap them uh, all over the image. Uh, but the trick is to only look at these PS points. Right. All right, in that, let me see, okay. In that, so in that PS point definition, there is uh, one more important part in the definition of a permanent scatterer. So uh, originally we defined them as being coherent over long periods of time. However, we have, we add one more definition to them. Um, we say also they have to be uh, point scatterers. So we define them as having to be, um, right, point scatterers. I showed you in INSA the difference between point scattering and distributed scattering. So PS is a point scatterer defined as having only one strong scatterer per resolution cell. So only one scatterer that is so strong that all the background scatterers, there may be more, uh, but he from this one scatterer is dominating. Okay, his backscattering is so strong that if there's other small objects in the, in the pixel in the resolution cell, it doesn't matter. The signal will be dominated by that one scatterer. Now, if we have that, if we have to have a point scatterer that has one more advantage, uh, it means we do not have spectral because spectral is defined as having spectral noise is defined as having several uh, scatterers in one resolution cell, which then by their coherent uh, the, by the interference of the faces of the return of the faces, they cause that speckle noise. We do not have speckle noise if we only have one strong scatterer in a pixel. Therefore, for PS, we define them as being point scatterers. So we're looking also that we only look at point scatterers. They do not suffer from speckle. So we do not have speckle error in our face measurements. So we have the measurements of point scatterers. And if we go back to the slides, which I still have to send you, say that they actually can go back. If you go back then to the slides from interferometry, right, uh, you will see that we separated distributed scatterer and point scatterer. And uh, for exactly that reason, right, because when we have then a point scatterer, a PS point, we get what we call a deterministic scattering. So we do not have speckle, we do not have speckle noise, we do not have temporal decorrelation. Uh, we, our pixels stay coherent over the whole time. That is because we define the PS, like the PS has to fulfill all these criteria to be considered a PS, right? So we then have a measurement that is deterministic. There is no speckle noise on it, so we do not need to correct for that. We do not need to do averaging. We do not need to do statistics. We do not get an expected value. We get a deterministic measurement, making our life so, more e so much more easier and our measurement more precise. So that is the other point of a PS point. A PS, a permanent scatterer, is also a point scatterer. So there's no speckle noise to make that sure, uh, clear. And for these points that you find, uh, they're stable, they're coherent over time, and they're not suffer from spectral noise. Now from that, we can get to the atmospheric phase screen, right? So we have images taken at different times. So they have APS differences. They have differences of the atmosphere, right? Um, but because we have a, a number of images, we can uh, estimate that we can interpolate that 
if we have a dense enough number of, if we have enough points, if we have a dense enough network, right, enough points per square kilometer, what it says here, uh, five points per square kilometer, something like that as minimum, then we can estimate them uh, and remove them. And um, uh, we are doing that by, because we know something about the atmospheric phase screen. We know that the atmospheric phase screen will change slowly in space, right? So if you go from one pixel to the next, the atmospheric phase screen will be similar. There will not be jumps, right? Um, if you go out in the weather and you walk a bit around, there's not gonna be a jump uh, in the weather situation, right? You're not gonna have a suddenly you know, strong rain and then two meter again, there's no rain, two meter again, there's strong rain, right? That is typically not happening. That would be very, very uncommon. Okay, so we can say uh, the atmospheric phase screen is related in space. From one pixel to next, it is related. But we also say it's not related in time. So from one image to the other image, there is no relation. We say that because there's a huge time difference between our images, right? There is, like in Terra sites, 11 days, okay, Sentinel is 12 days, something like that, several days time difference. Uh, and, and from 10 days time difference, we can say, the, well, the weather from today to the weather in 10 days, you know, who knows, there's no relation. It's unrelated in time. If we have, images that have a much shorter time difference, a much shorter baseline, okay? For example, uh, airborne systems or also ground-based uh, systems that are on the ground, they probably take a SAR image then every couple of minutes or every hour. We would say differently, right? And we would also say, well, probably, you know, from one minute to the next, even from one hour to the next hour, the weather is probably still related, okay? Right, so uh, then we would also say, if we have a situation like that, we could also say, well, it's also related in time. We say it's unrelated in time because the time difference between these two images is, is rather large. We talk about days. And as we all know, from today, the weather today to the weather in 10 days, that's probably unrelated. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at the processing step, step by step. PS processing is a large multi-step process. So we start with SAR images, right? Many SAR images. So we would say as a rule of thumb, at least 20. Okay, better more, okay. Uh, these images are here um, set in in time uh, and the spatial baseline and temporal baseline of these images, right? So this is quite a lot of images. We then select one master image, okay? And then we co-register all images to that master image. We then take a DM, Right. And then we take the differential interferograms, right? So we remove the DEM so that we are, uh, we remove the flat earth and the DEM so that we have only the motion left plus DEM error plus atmosphere. Right. All right, then we uh, take the first PS selections. Uh, so we take a subset of the PS points. We form them a sparse grid between them. We use that to estimate the atmospheric phase screen. I'll show you soon how we do that. And then we remove it, All right? So first estimate it and remove it. And then we can do uh, time series analysis uh, for each of the PS points. I then get to a displacement field estimation, right? So you see it's a multi-step process. Where well, we use many images, then generate also many differential interferograms, 
uh, to then get to the to our displacement field generation. Okay. So, okay, I think I need that. Now, the first question that comes up would be, well, it's all nice and good what I'm telling you, but how would I know which pixel is a PS point? Right? How can I know that? Right? I, I look at that noise, right? I, I have no way of knowing. And uh, the, we can do that by looking uh, at many images. Okay, we need a, a large number of images again ideally 20 or more to identify the stable points over time of a set of images. And there are many ways to do that. Okay, so there are many approaches where we can say, well, this is a stable point and this is not a stable point, but the, the standard way in PS INSA processing is the uh, amplitude distribution. So we are looking at the distribution of the amplitude uh, over time. So we are looking here. Uh, we want a point that has a high amplitude and a low standard deviation of the amplitude uh, over time. Right? That's also a, a, a mean standard deviation rate ratio much larger than two. So like in this example, the, the blue histogram. Now, why are we doing that, right? Because actually we want to, what we actually want is phase stability. What we are looking at is amplitude stability. And the reason is that it's easier, okay? Now, looking at the amplitude stability, so looking at a point that has a high amplitude and a low standard deviation of that high amplitude uh, is easy and is a valid estimation of phase stability for points that has a high amplitude. So if your point has a high amplitude, if it's a, a, a white point, okay, a strong scatter, a high amplitude, if this point also has a, you know, a small standard deviation of amplitude. So if the amplitude is not changing much, right? That's a very good uh, indication of a stable phase as well. So for points with high amplitude, uh, that is directly related, in this case, amplitude stability is then directly related to phase stability. If your point has not so high amplitude, that relation is not so good anymore. Okay, so we may have points that have phase stability, but are not so, do not have such a high amplitude. Um, so are not so wide in your SAR image, right? Um, for them, the amplitude distribution index is not a good uh, indicator. And there are other methods to find such points. But uh, for points, with a high amplitude, it is a very good indication of PS. And typically, as we are looking at point scatterers, point scatterers have a dominating the scattering in their pixels. So they need to be bright, okay? You need to have one strong scatterer so that you dominate the background. So in that case, it is, uh, a rather logic and meaningful way to analyze here only the amplitude. Again, there is more than one method to look at your PS points and we talk about these different approaches and some approaches do also or mainly look at the phase and the phase stability. But the standard way is looking at amplitude stability uh, for points with a high amplitude uh, that have very small standard deviation of that amplitude 
we say these are PS points or actually typically at that stage, at that very early stage, we call them PS candidates because we are now not sure if they're really stable points, but we say, well, that's a, a pretty good candidate to be a PS point. Another advantage to do that based only on the amplitude data is that if we do that, we can do that as a very first step and do not need to process the phases yet. So we do not need to process the differential interferograms for all points, right? We could select our PS candidates first and then calculate uh, the differential interferogram only for the sub of these points. So not for the whole image, but only for uh, this PSC, uh, which would save us also calculation time. Okay, so that's one way to identify uh, PS points of PS candidates, right? All right, and then now we are looking at these different phase components. So we are looking here, right? Uh, Right, we're looking at height uh, together with over the baselines, and then we have um, uh, uh, right, we have relative velocity average, relative velocity uh, estimation of linear velocity. Let me say it's a temporal difference times t. Relative velocity of that. We also have uh, nonlinear motion components, right? Uh, and um, also, we are going to have, if we estimate all of them and remove them, we're going to have these phase residues, which can be related to the uh, um, to the atmosphere. Uh, to not corrected nonlinear motion to the atmosphere or to noise, right? So this is uh, this phase residues. I come back to that uh, again to explain you what we're gonna do with them. Okay, but just here they're mostly related to well elements that are nonlinear mm -hmm. if we don't estimate them correctly, or elements of the motion that we do not estimate correctly. The atmosphere well, and plus noise. Right? These are the elements that we did not estimate them correctly. Okay. Move my drawings. Okay, so elevation error. So we have an elevation error, right? A DEM error. Again, you remove the DEM, right? You remove the topographic phase estimated from the DEM. But it's not going to be perfect. There's going to be an error. However, the elevation, right, the error of the elevation, that is related to the baseline. Right? That is a function of the baseline. So the height, uh, there is a the phase related to the height, or from the DM error, or from the height as ever you take it. Right? That is have a relation to the baseline. We saw that in the equations before, for the topographic phase, the baseline is in the equation, while it's not for, for motion, right? So if we can separate a part of the phase that is related to the baseline, then we separate the part of the phase that is related to topography, right? Which we again can then use to estimate the DM error and also remove it. Now, the motion, so if we estimate a constant velocity, if we say we have a linear motion, a constant velocity over our image, then we can form a function, right? We know the, we know the time difference between each image, okay, from one image to another. So we can estimate and we can, we can set up a function that says for this time difference with this velocity, the overall deformation would be 
so many millimeters. And based on the equation that I showed you, that would correlate to a given phase, right? So if we assume a constant velocity, we can again set up such a function because uh, we know the time difference. So we would know for this velocity, how much overall deformation would be related um, after some after a given number of days between them, right? Okay, right. Uh, let me come here. Okay, let me explain it in step one, then maybe we go back then. Okay, so now what we're doing. All right, let me move my things out. Okay, so we have, we are looking at PS points now. So we're not looking at images anymore. We're looking at points. If you want, we are now looking at a point cloud. Okay. So we're not really doing so much image processing anymore. It's now much more like point cloud processing or topology. So from one point here to another point, we can form like a, a relation, right? Such a vector. Okay, right. All right. Remember, we are always looking at differences, right? So we're always looking at difference between one point to another point. Okay, so from one point to another point, we can now have a look at the equations to see the difference in height between these two points, right? Is the, this one here, delta H, right, is related to the wavelengths. The difference in the topographic phase, the range, the incidence angle and the baseline. And this is all we know, right? Um, I mean, we know the range, we know the incidence angle, we know the baseline, we know the wavelengths. So our relation is between delta H and delta, uh, the topographic phase, right? Now, actually, I should not show you the equation like this. Actually, we should uh, we should solve it towards uh, the topographic phase as a function of the others, okay? Because that's how we actually calculate the common steps, right? So, for a given height difference, we can calculate the given phase difference, okay? So. This relation we can set up. Similar, right, for a given um, linear motion, right, so we assume a constant motion, right, we can calculate the given, actually, it should also be delta, to be honest, there should be a delta here. We can uh, calculate the difference in motion phase between the one point to the other point. So given that we can set up a set of linear equations, okay, and um, solve, for example, these are least square estimations for, uh, you know, toward height difference and linear motion difference between these two. There's one problem though. So we have many images, right? We, we said we take like 20 images or something like that. And it's, it's just a, a rule of thumb, okay? So if we have so many images and we only have two unknown variables, delta H, right, as a difference in height and a difference in motion between these two pixels, the senior two PS points should be easy to solve. But in we, we have more unknowns, right? So for each image, we also have an unknown 
here, which is the wrapping factor, right? So uh, we have an unknown wrapping factor. You see that's a factor times the two pi for the topography. So how much the topography phase is wrapped between these two pixels, we do not know how many wrapping cycles there are. Uh, similar, we do not know how many wrapping cycles for the motion uh, value there are between these two pixels. Uh, and as they are, for each image, they might be different. So we have always more unknowns uh, than equations, right? So we always have an underestimated uh, solution. Okay, we always, instead of an overestimated one, we have an underestimated solution. All right. Okay, however, also underestimated solutions, we, we still can solve them. Okay, we have methods to do that. All right, so um, still doable. Now, one more thing I did not mention yet. So we form here a link between two PS points. Okay. Yes, okay. Now we estimated here the topographic difference and the motion difference between these two. But there is also, right, and the atmosphere, we did not estimate that, right? So we have, before we had the equations of topography and velocity, and we said to another phase component would be the atmosphere. We ignore the noise, the flat earth we have removed by, it's from the differential interferograms already. Uh, so, Missing part is the atmosphere. And that's now coming to the trick of it all, right? So we said from one pixel to the next, the atmosphere is changing slowly. So if our two PS points are very close together in space, the atmosphere, the component that's in between these two pixels, right? That's the atmospheric difference between these two PS points. It's very small if our distance is very small. And so if our atmosphere, if the part of our atmosphere, it has to be less than two pi, okay? Much less than two pi, because if it's more than two pi, then it's more than we can, and it's more than in the rep phase, and then we could not, solve anymore because we would be random, we would be ambiguous. But if our atmospheric phase and the atmospheric phase, you see it's in here, in the residual, okay, in the what's left unsolved part, that one, that residual has to be much less than two pi. Okay? If that is the case, then we can solve. So if our two points are very close together, and typically we say less than two kilometer or less than one kilometer, then typically the atmospheric phase difference from one point to that point is the phase residual of that is much less than two pi, much less than one pi even. Uh, so in that case, uh, we can solve for them, right? So the trick is that these two points have to be close together and then the atmospheric phase will be in that residual, but it's so small uh, that we can still solve for the rest. We can solve that. There are different ways to do that. You see, it's an underestimated system. One way to do that is, for example, here using an integer least square because we know uh, A1, B1, this unknown wrapping parameters, they're integers, right? Uh, so you have one phase, you have zero phase cycle, one phase cycle, two phase cycle, three, so it's an integer, okay? Knowing that um, with integer least squares, we can solve that, for example, 
we can also solve uh, via peri. Is it called per periodogram? Oh my god! Right. So basically, um, like you can make a stupid solution. Okay, what is a stupid solution? Well, you set like um, a range of acceptable height differences or motion differences between these two points. So you'd say from zero to 100 meter height difference or minus 100 to 100 meter height difference, minus 50 to one to 50 millimeter uh, motion difference. Okay, just as an example, okay. Uh, between these two points, then you could set up, you know, all possible solutions in that solution space. And you would look for the highest peak for the one with the smallest residual, right? So basically, we always try to optimize uh, this one to have the smallest residual vector, right? Um, so integerly squares would work, setting up periodogram, being very stupid and just goes through all the um, possible values and look for the ones with the lowest um, residuals. Um, these are all different solutions, right? That, that, that do work for you, okay? Now, having done that, right? Having done that, we are left with the residuals, okay? And the residuals that we are left with, right? That is two large parts, the atmosphere. So we are left with a vector, right? We have here a vector for each image, a vector of residuals that includes mostly the atmosphere plus some noise, right? Plus maybe in some nonlinear velocity that we not estimate correctly and some other errors, but mostly the atmosphere, which means we now have uh, values for the atmosphere we now basically have an estimation of the atmosphere which we can use. And that's the key element of it. Now, me running out of time a bit, let me see. Let me still go to the next two slides. Um, so how that all plays together. So that's how we get from a connection between two points to estimate uh, the height difference, uh, linear estimation difference and the atmospheric vector uh, between them. Okay, so what we are doing is, uh, we're starting with, with these points, okay? Then we form a network between these points. In this example, just the Delaunay triangulation, we could also make different networks or multi-layered networks, you know, these points more far connected and layers of points connected more closely. You can do different things, right? Uh, up to the, you know, it's topology at the end, right? You can uh, use their many methods from, from topology. All right, we form a network between them. And for each of these connections, we can now estimate, as in the method of the last slide, the height difference between them, the velocity difference between them, and the residuals of them. Um, so basically the atmosphere big part between them. So this is the difference here each time along such an edge. Okay, so what we estimated in the last slide was the difference between these two points. So it's a difference along an edge, uh, a vector actually, because this uh, vector has a direction, this edge has a direction from there to there, right? Or from here to here, this one has a direction. Okay, so here I give you the height difference so from that point that I just painted uh, to that point. There's a 10 meter height difference from that point. That direction is minus 15 meter. And similar, we would have such vectors for the velocity and the residuals, I just didn't show them here, you know, to make this slide not too overloaded. Okay, so for each of the connection, we estimated these values, right? 
And again, these connections need to be short, right? So we connect the closest points. That's typically so why we use Delaunay to connect the closest points. Okay, they need to be shorter than one kilometer, two kilometer, so that the atmospheric difference between them is not too big, so that we can estimate them atmosphere free or with very little atmospheric influence between them. All right, now after we did the end that, sorry, I have to, this is always, okay. Now after we've done that, we do uh, estimate, we do define basically a reference point. So in this case, we said this point here is the reference point. Okay, so that's this point here on that side. And then we follow these, these edges, right? So you see that point here is 10 meter, right? And then you see uh, this one is, in this, in this direction is minus 10 meter. So it, in that direction up versus 10 plus 10 meters, so at this point here is 20 meter, right? And so on, we follow them through all the points along this network. And now for each point on the network, we have a height relative to our reference point, which we define to be zero, or if we know the true height of that point, we could also start from the true height of that point and then follow the network, okay? But typically, okay, we set it to zero. So for each point now, for each PSC, we have the height with relation to the reference point. We're gonna have the motion, the velocity, in relation to the reference point. And we're gonna have the atmosphere residual vector, okay, the residual vector uh, in relation to the reference point. And that's one more thing what happens, right? You see, um, because we just follow always on these edges and the differences on the edges is typically not so high in velocity. Uh, and uh, height often, depending on if you're in urban area, it doesn't matter, uh, especially the atmosphere, the difference is not so high. But we, we can also call that whole process here an unwrapping along edges, okay? Because we are going along the edges, you see, if we look at the atmosphere, okay? The atmosphere from here to here, we said it's less than two pi, okay? That was like one of our requirements. So. Uh, that is like less than two pi. So from there to there, the unwrapped and the wrapped values are identical if we go along that edge. But now here we start again, right? And we go to the next edge, right? And we have another residual vector here. We can also call this process an unwrapping along the edges. So what we'll be doing is we also unwrap these residual values here along the edges. So when we go from our reference point then to another point more far away on the edges, okay, that point, uh, uh, is it that point here, that point on the edge, right? We get then an unwrapped um, residual vector there with respect to the to the reference point. Okay, and now this unwrapped residual vector, we're looking at that, we are saying, well, you know, that's mostly atmosphere. So what we just did going along the edges is we just unwrap the atmosphere along the edges. And now we have along the image, uh, the atmosphere, the unwrapped atmosphere, which we now can remove. We do one more step though, after we have that, we are doing typically a mean filtering of that vector in, in space. So we say, well, you know, the atmosphere is, related in space, slowly changing in space. So we filter these vectors here in, in, in space with a mean filter, with an averaging. And we said it's unrelated in time. 
so in time, you see we have a vector. I told you we have a vector, which is a vector in time. So between these different images, they have a different acquisition time. So it's a vector in time. We use a high pass filter, an edge filter, right? In that direction. And that is then what we use as atmospheric phase, which we then can remove from all the points. After we removed the atmospheric phase, right? The last step is after atmospheric phase removal, we again do the whole process for all points. Okay. I'm I still gonna manage to finish on time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we still we're gonna here from that reference point. Okay, we start the whole process again, we start all over. We throw away all the values we estimate. And actually, we, at the end, we only keep that, that atmospheric value. After we remove the atmosphere, we start from that reference point, and then we connect to all other points directly. So even the points far away, we connect them directly, even points very, very far away, right? We would connect them directly because now there is no atmosphere anymore. Okay, we removed that atmosphere. We estimated the atmosphere over these edges here, we removed it. Now we make from the reference point, again, we start at zero, basically. We forget all the values we have, we just after we remove the atmosphere, we connect all of them again, uh, make long connections and process the values. Again, using, now I want to go back. Yeah, here, again, starting here from, making connections. Yeah. Ah, here, this slide is what I want. Okay, again, then from this point, let's say this is the reference point now, we make connections to other points, but to all other points and calculate, again, estimate them. Again, here are these uh, estimation methods that we choose for all the points uh, based on that. And now we can do that even for very long connections, points that are very far away. It doesn't matter, right? Because we remove the atmosphere. So we do that from the reference point now to all the points. And that's how it works. And that took me a very long time to explain, right? Because that's the critical part of this. And so that's exactly the technical detail how, it's, how it works. And I made it. Oh, no, I'm a little bit late. I'm sorry. Okay, one minute late, or two minutes late. Uh, but we're gonna stop here, right? And next time we're looking then much more on what we can do with it, okay? But this part is very important that you understand how we get there before we show you the applications, what we're gonna do, different approaches and so on. Okay, so today was very theoretically, uh, but in my opinion, very, very important. So thanks for listening. Uh, this is a bit complicated part, um takes everybody some time to understand that okay uh i will go back again a bit and then we go through the applications and to different methods and then at the end i hope you will understand when i talk about the different methods because there's more than one way to do that the different approaches uh and to understand the difference you have to understand how it's all working all right uh, thanks again for listening. Um, Sishan, do we have questions? Yes, Professor, we have questions. Approximately 10 okay. questions. So, All right. Okay. Um, now I'm sure if we may probably do one, but we are, almost, we are already a bit over time. So oh, okay. I will do them again next time for sure. But let me have a look if I can answer one quick one, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, is it possible to perform time series analysis of lens like using the INSA alone? Uh, yes, basically, yes, there is a process that's called, uh, what's that called? It's stacking, I think, stacking, INSA stacking or something like that, uh, where you mm, just stack these results one after another and not really solve for it like in PS INSA. I will not talk much about that though, also in the upcoming, 
but we are talking about very different methods on solving PS inside D inside or on uh, over the next time because landslides uh, are a difficult topic for the, the PS inside. Okay, uh, for several reasons. A, there are not enough PS points. B, sometimes too fast. We come to all of that. We are very interested in landslides. But yes, you can do that. Uh, typically, you have them to stack those D inside interferograms and then just estimate along that, basically ignoring the atmosphere, which you can do because the landslide is typically rather small. All right, time is up just now. One of our participants said it's good that I stop on time. So let me uh, stick with that, trying to stop on time. I'm uh, gonna be next time. It took me a bit more today on that part. Longer than I saw it actually today. Spent longer time on that, just a couple of slides. <laughs> All right, doesn't matter. We still have lots of courses. Um, Dishan, when do we see each other next time? Yeah, we will uh, actually be here on 23rd, not 22. <laughs> According to the previous schedule, it, it should be 22, but uh, we will be here on 23rd, 23rd December. Right. I think that's important information that we actually shifted uh, to 23rd yeah. because on 22, there's another course colliding with ours. So we, we shifted to the 23rd. Okay. So next yeah. time it's on the 23rd, do not forget it. Um, all right. Okay. Good talking to you. Um, we come back to that. I'm going to make you understand it. Okay. <laughs> do not worry if it's not all clear yet. All right. We also come to more application and more beautiful pictures again so that you know what you can do with it. I know you're all more interested in that. Okay. But you also need to learn the problems and where you can use it and where maybe not. Okay. All right. Was well, good seeing you. Uh, I mean, see you okay online, <laughs> but still, that's good. Okay, bye bye. Have a good day, good evening, wherever you are. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Okay, everyone. So I have actually seen many questions about the slides and uh, yeah, I actually also Professor Timo has discussed that uh, next in the next class, we will provide the slides actually before the class, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much. And see you in the next class. We remember that uh, our class actually has moved uh, from 22 to 23. So please remember that we will have the class on the Thursday at the same time, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Okay.